we, we talked about some leadership topics with the executive group. And for those of you who aren't executive, I can't tell you what we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> but there'll be a special meeting after you make executive, and we'll fill you in. Um, <laughs> Come on now, feel, feel the burn a little bit. I want to talk about some le uh, some more leadership ideas this morning. I've um, I've enjoyed coaching people throughout the years. People come to me have come to me many many times, and I'm sure a lot of leaders and people come to them and say, "I'm stuck. I, I I'm stuck at this level. I'm trying to break through to the next level. You you've already gone to that next level. Will you help me? Help me get to that next level. Help me figure out." What is going on in my head that's holding me back? And over the years, I've done that. And you, you get a little bit of a knack. Some of you at, at, at high levels of leadership, you get a knack for kind of seeing through. After, it, it usually takes me about three months to figure somebody out because it's never what they say it is. It's always something else. It takes me about three months. I figure it out. And then, and then you're like a doctor. You prescribe. You give them a prescription. Here's, I, I made my diagnosis. Here's the diagnosis, here's the prescription. And now I want you to go home and I want you to follow the prescription. And the doctors in the room say that's the biggest challenge, isn't it? Getting the patient to follow the prescription. Take your medicine. You know, do what you need to do. Go through your physical therapy, whatever it happens to be. So today, this is gonna be a little bit of fun. Um, I have, 15 different case studies of people, different types of personalities, that I want you to rate yourself and see if there's any of these people in you. These are all real people that came to me over the last 20 years or so and said, I have this issue, will you help me? And each of them had their own unique perspective. So I, what I want you to do as we go through this, I want you to rate yourself on a scale of one to five. One is, this is not me at all. And five, this is me. You're talking about me. Okay, and in between might be a little piece of you, okay? Because what this could help you do is prescribe for yourself, diagnose for yourself, oh, that's an issue for me. Prescribe for yourself a solution for that and then go to work on making it happen, okay? Fair enough? Yeah. We'll have some fun with this. The first, and, and I will tell you, I already, I could single out people in this room on just about every one of these 15 and say, this one, brother, sister, is you. But I won't do that. We will talk about other people for now. The first one. Tactician syndrome. Tactician syndrome. These are the people who know the answers to every question. These are the people who correct you when you misspeak. These are the people who let the company know when there's a typo in the email blast. These are the people who know every piece of the back office. They think they can do the tutorials a little better then the tutorials are done in the back office. I, I, I have great empathy for this group because I have been one most of my life. I struggle against the tactician syndrome. You know, because that's how I originally became known. I was the guy, he understood the comp plan. And I was the guy, oh, go ask Eric. He'll figure out this thing. And here's the challenge. For each one of these, I'm going to give you a problem, a lesson, an assignment, and a test. Okay, a problem, a lesson, an assignment, and a test. So the problem is, with a tactician, you get no growth. People don't follow tacticians. You have all the answers. And tacticians, isn't it confusing that you don't have the growth? Because you have all the answers. You'd think that your answers would inspire others to do something. They don't. They just don't. So 
You have to learn when somebody says, well, you understand the common plan, tell me. You have to stop answering and say, well, here's something, here's a place where you can get that answer and stop being that person. Or when somebody says, well, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out how to do a campaign. Oh, call so-and-so because they're the, the king or the queen of campaigns. <laughs> They'll show you how to do that. So the problem is no, no growth or, re or revolving door group. Big front lines, revolving door group, no inspiration. The lesson is, is tacticians make a living, culture builders make a fortune. Build a culture. You have some emotional, um, a reservoir of emotional goodwill in your organization. What you'll notice with the top earners, they're just big, embracing, loving people, and don't ask them about that tech, technical stuff. They're not interested in that technical stuff. Isn't that fun? It's fascinating. You talk to Jordan, Jordan knows the answers, he's just not going to tell you. <laughs> he's going to say there's places for that. So, the best blend that I've seen, and I went, I was a tactician, almost pure tactician, and my only, gro my only growth was what I did. I wasn't, people looked to other people for inspiration. Um, and then I watched all these other people, and I said, okay, I've got to learn to be a culture builder. <sighs> I've got to brighten up, you know, I've got to show up, I've got to come into the room, I've got to embrace people, I've got to connect, because I'm kind of introverted. Um, by nature, it's against my nature to go out and be, you know, a welcoming, friendly person to the to the people I don't know. But what I've seen, and I've and, and the person that I talked to, the the case study that this is about, the guy's name is Ron. We were at a convention in Vegas, and uh, we were sitting down in the lounge, and he came in and said, "Hey, can I sit down with you?" And I said, "Yeah." And he sat down, and he said, "Eric, I'm stuck." I can't get past this level. I just can't do it. And can you help me? Can you teach me? And he was a pure tactician. And he said, what's my problem? And I said, you really want to know? And he said, yeah, I really want to know. I said, you're a tactician. He said, what does that mean? Well, and then I explained it. He said, he got mad. You don't know me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know you're a tactician. That's all I know. I said, buddy, I love you, but this is a this is some people are are have been ingrained to be um, to be accepted by having the answers, and that makes them feel good. Um, learning to grow yourself beyond that. The uh, the assignment here <clears throat> is focus more on relationships in your organization and less on tactics. Focus more on personal relationships and less on tactics. And here's the test, interesting test. What happens when you walk into a room? If you see the culture builders, they naturally have a little group of people around them. And everybody's talking to them and it's fun. And, and the, the tacticians don't. They have all the room to themselves. They don't attract this fun-loving little atmosphere. It's interesting, you know, and, they, and it frustrates them because they have all the answers. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so on a scale of one to five, one, this isn't me at all. Five, this is me. Rate yourself. Okay, number two. The Messiah Complex. The problem, she had no growth, making a living but no duplication, a lot of it was personal effort. The lesson here is get more people with top skills and <clears throat> stop being the Messiah there to take care of everybody. The Messiah says, I'll take care of everything. No leaders have to develop because they ride in on their white horse to solve it. And one of the other things is they're the only people doing the presentation. If there's a weekly meeting going on, they're the only ones doing the presentation. They haven't duplicated anything. 
They come in, yes, I will save the room. <laughs> Bring me your poor, your prospects. <laughs> Are we out of food? Does anybody have loaves and fishes? Bring them in. <laughs> I'll divide them up. So the lesson here is get more people with some top skills. Get some people with presentation skills. Get some people with training skills. Our certified training program does some of that. But the assignment is create a presentation training session in your area. A formalized class. This was my assignment to this woman that came to me. Create a once a week presentation school, a class that you, how many people, you know, you go into your group, how many people would like to learn how to do a presentation? Person with the marker makes the money. Would you like to get in front of the room and would you like to inspire others? Yes, me, me, me. So have it in somebody's house, have people practice with each other until they get as good as you or almost as good as you because what you don't want to do is what you don't want to do is say, okay, fine, well, you need to do it. I just got to get out of the way. You get out of the way, they go up there, they do a terrible job, and the prospects go, well, I don't want to join this. This is terrible. Because So the quality goes from a 9 to a 2. You can't do that. Well, we have to duplicate, so we have to let them get to a 2. Well, no, you don't. You, get, you can go from a 9 to a 7, but you need to take care of that because those prospects are valuable. So the test, how many people in your organization can do a rock star presentation? How many? That's the test. Messiah complex, one to five. Rate yourself. Three, personal development deficiency. Their organization grows with fits and starts and stops and starts and stops and starts. Got a little passion for a minute, and then it fades. The lesson here is you only get to make what you are. You only get to make what you are. The assignment has become more devoted to being a lifelong learner. My assignment for this type of person always is commit to 30 minutes a day of personal development, personal growth. Make it a ritual, make it a habit. Books that will fill you up. Because those books will, will help you with your consistency. Will help you with everything that you have to do. And audio books, audio programs in your automobile, videos on the internet, whatever. Personal growth. One to five. Here's the test for personal development deficiency. How many books have you read in the last year? How many seminars have you attended in the last year? How many, I'm not talking about <laughs> seminars inside of this company. How many seminars have you attended to develop your skills? How many superstars have you interviewed or taken to breakfast, lunch, or dinner and asked them for their secrets? How many tape programs, tape programs, CD programs have you listened to? <laughs> I still love cassettes. Still do. Number four, big deal syndrome. They could not resist the big deal. I'm going to sign up Mercedes Benz, <laughs> and they are going to make me a fortune. Yeah. They're just in love with it. They're just in love with it. Oh, I got this guy, and he has 28 sales offices, and all of those supervisors are going to get involved, and then they're going to get their customers involved, and I have a proposal in two months that I'm going to make a presentation to them. So between now and then, don't bother me, because I have to get my PowerPoint ready. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I learned a long time ago is the big deal is the little deal. The little deal is the big deal. You know, forget Mercedes-Benz. I mean, if it happens to happen, fine, but don't spend any time on it. Give me a dissatisfied homemaker. Give me somebody who works in a job that they hate. Give me somebody that's never done anything like this before. That's a big deal. That could lead you to a fortune. You know, some people fall in love with, with celebrities, athletes. Athletes, 
They give me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> Any of you ever had been introduced? Oh, I want to introduce you. This person used to play professional football seven years ago. They're a big deal. <laughs> and I've had, you know, Hall of Famers in my organization before. And you know what? They're a bunch of Siamese cats. They're so cool. They think they're just so cool. And they're ready, you know, sh should I sign something now? <laughs> like, sign somebody up. <laughs> Somebody says, oh, I'm going to introduce you to the, you know, this former Olympian. Fabulous. Let me tell you what I'd say to the former Olympians and the athletes. I said, can I be honest with you? Because you live in a world where people aren't really honest with you. But can I be honest with you? <laughs> I swear to God, that's what I say now. I, did, I didn't used to say this. I said, oh my gosh, I used to watch you all the time. That's amazing. Oh, wow. Now what I say to them is, is look, I'm going to be honest with you. <clears throat> how much have you made from your athletic endeavors? How much do you continue to make from what you did when you played professionally? I said, nothing. I said, how hard did you work to become a professional? How hard did you train? Really hard. I said, I'll tell you what. In this business, nobody cares about what you did in the past. They just don't. The computer can't see your resume. They can't see mine, thank goodness. <laughs> but, if you'll commit the same effort that you committed to become a professional in your sport, to become a professional here, it'll pay you more than you earned in your professional career and for a lifetime. If you're willing to do that. If not, it's nice to meet you. Have a great day. Take care. And the, and the person who brought him to me is like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is my ticket to the moon. <laughs> you just killed him. And then they go take him to lunch. Don't worry about what he just said. I'll, come on, let me go buy you breakfast. <laughs> Serious. They're like looking at me. I'm never bringing an athlete to him again. <laughs> Big deal syndrome. Big deal is a little deal. Focus on the, fo the formula for financial independence. Your ability to get a large group of people to do a few simple things over a consistent period of time. It's not about all that other stuff. It's not going to give you your ticket to freedom. So your test is where are you spending your time? What I tell people when they come to me with the big shot or an athlete or you know, some company, just fine. Just don't spend a lot of time. Yeah. Fantastic. Wonderful. You know, because those people get lost in it. They'll build on it for, you know, I'm in my third meeting with the hospital system. Mm -hmm. And my third meeting is, and it's really going good. Everybody loves it. I just have three more meetings. <laughs> and over the course of the next six months to get to the top board decision. In the meantime, they could have built a residual income and they decided not to. One to five. Have you tempted on the big deal syndrome? Number six. Oh, excuse me. One to five. Number five. The follower complex. They just want to follow the company, the upline, the area leaders. They're uninspiring. They're just hanging out. I'm talking about leadership here now. This person wanted to go to another level, but they were, they exhibited almost zero leadership. They'd been a follower their whole life. They'd been a rule follower and a people follower their whole life. The lesson it, here is people want their leader to have some spark, some sizzle, some vision, some fire. You can have your own brand of that, but people, your group really needs to see it. They need to know that you've, you've got a little bit of vision too. That you see something for your group to happen too. So the assignment is to work on your image, to put together some campaigns, and to schedule some events that give your organization a sense of pride. That you do it. I will tell you, it changed my life. An event that changed my life in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the leader 
the clear leader. There was no other leader. The leader in Minneapolis was Mike Nelson. He was the leader, and there was no doubt everybody else was follower. I was happy to be follower. He was one of my early mentors. And the meetings were pretty tight, man. We did meetings every Tuesday night, Thursday night, Saturday morning, and that was our rhythm, and that was our schedule, and they were good. And I was known that I always had at least one guest at every meeting. Young guy. I was known for that. And I was proud of it. There's never a meeting where I don't have a guest. And, you know, every once in a while I built up to my own little row. <laughs> feeling good. But I was clearly a follower, right? And then he went out of town and went and built in Indianapolis, Indiana for 90 days. He was doing a little 90-day campaign there with, with a group. And all of a sudden the meeting started to fall apart. And they started to be bad, and it and, and started to be a little bit embarrassing, and my prospects were looking at me funny, and, and I'm like, what am I going to do? And I went to the committee, because there's usually a committee, I went to the committee, and I said, committee, can we turn the music back on when this thing starts? Can we not have 8,000 chairs in the room? Can we not, can we have the air conditioning turned on? Can we do, you know, what happened? And they said, well, we've got a meeting in a month, we'll talk about that, and we'll get back to you. Pat, pat on the head. Go away, kid. And I was stuck because I was full time. So I did something and I went from being a follower to a leader in two weeks. I booked my own hotel room with money I did not have. The embassy suite at the airport in Minneapolis. $200. I didn't have the money. And I, I booked it. Theirs was on a Tuesday. They, they, they'd also dropped off from Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday to just Tuesday and Saturday. So I said, okay, I'll do it on Thursday, and I'm going to do it in 10 days. And I told them. They just kind of laughed at me a little bit and said, okay, fine, fantastic. Knock them dead. So now I'm stuck. I booked a room for $200 with money I didn't have. And what if I show up with one guest now? It's going to be pitiful. Me and one guest in a room this size? What if I have one row? I'm dead. So guess what I had to do? I had to do all the things that I said I was complaining about with the other thing. I had, to, I had to make the registration table. I had the information packets. I put together my own little mix tape for the music before and after. I had my displays. I had my little sign-in forms. I had my little name tags. you got to go get name tags. I got all the name tags, and then, then guess what I had to do? I had to fill the room. So I made probably 400 phone calls in 10 days. Never done that in my life. And guess how many people I had in my first meeting? About 45. 45 people in my first meeting. And guess what? I would have never got to 45 if I sat in that other meeting. Ever. I became a leader two weeks. I went from being a follower to being a leader. You can too. So, yeah, good, right? So the test is, what's your next 90-day game plan? Does it have a name? Does everyone in your group know about it? Are they excited? Are you leading? Or are you just following? And a note on this one. This does not mean you create your own system in place of the company system. It does not mean that you subvert whatever somebody else is doing in the marketplace. It doesn't mean those things. It means you can have an identity inside of a, a meeting that you're doing with your group where you get together beforehand and you circle up afterwards and you get together and have, and have a drink after the, after the meeting in the lounge or whatever. But that has to be on purpose. All right, number six. One to five, what are you on the, on the follower complex? One to five, be honest. Because when you're done with this, we're going to hand it to your upline and have them rate you <laughs> on all of this. I'm not going to write this one down. Well, I kind of will. This is a big one. If I stick around long enough, success is bound to happen to me syndrome. If I just hang out, Success is coming. No, it's not. No, it's not. You could be in the right place at the right time. That doesn't matter. The company can go through hypergrowth. That doesn't matter. You're not the company. Ship doesn't, you know, the rising tide doesn't lift all boats. Your boat isn't going to go up just because everybody else's boat's going up. 
But I see so many people that says, you know what, I, I, I made one commitment, I'm just never quitting. Well, you have to, that's one piece. The other piece is you have to do something. <laughs> the third piece is you have to improve. So not, just not quitting, I had a, a friend of mine, I mean, he was around for 12 years in the company. I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. That was his brand. I'm not quitting. Everybody knew him as I'm not quitting guy. Never broke through. Never got to six figures after 12 years. We sat down. We had this conversation. He's going through the motions and waiting for something to happen. Because he's been told that, you know, if I just stay, then it's going to be okay. The lesson for him was urgency, 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 urgency. We got to do it now. We got to go now. We got to build now. We got to grow now. Hanging out, one piece, but it's just a tiny piece, and it's kind of a sad piece. You know the people. You have them in your mind. Isn't it a sad little group? Don't you feel bad for them? It's like, gosh, I, lo I love it, you know. You know where they end up? They end up at the registration table. <laughs> at your meeting. They're the greeter. At your meeting. True. So my assignment for this friend of mine was a 90-day blitz to re-energize his life. He'd been around for 12 years. 90-day blitz to just get crazy, irrational. And he had never made more than 30000 a year in 12 years. In the next year, after he did his 90-day blitz, he made $100,000. After 12 years. And he had a brand inside of that company. Nobody expected him to break out. He had to fight that expectation, too. So the test question is, be honest. Are you going through the motions? Yes or no? Are you in the stick around, hope it happens group? Number seven. Idea of the week complex. <laughs> These people have no core commitments, no daily method of operation. They're treasure hunters. I'm searching for treasure. I have this idea, I think it's the one. Next week they have that idea. I think it's the one. Now we're just going to cold call realtors. Okay, I think that's the one. <laughs> and they go from comp, you know, idea to idea to idea. The lesson in, in this is the person that, and I've, I've been guilty of this too, you know, some of us who have you know, ideas, we think about stuff, oh, that might work. One thing, first of all, is never test an idea on your group. Go do it yourself first. And if it works, then you can expand it a little bit. And then if it's solid, then you can implement it into the team. But never use your group as a case study. Uh, you know, as a, as a test case, I should say. People in our profession crave an assignment. They crave an assignment. And if you give them a different assignment every week, you're going to kill them. Or every month, they could just they'll, they'll get mentally exhausted and they won't follow you. So your assignment here: what few simple things are you going to ask yourself and your group to do over a consistent period of time? What is your daily method of operation that you're going to just stay with? Jordan's done an amazing job with that, by the way. Many of you have done an amazing job, but we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this, and that's it. Relax your brain. Bring your passion to those things, and let's go after it. Here's the test. If you asked your downline, could they tell you what your group's core commitments are? Could they tell you? What's the daily method of operation for your group? Could they tell you what it is? If they can't, you've got to examine that. Scale of one to five, idea of the week, do you fall into that? Mr. or Mrs. Invisible. Mr. or Mrs. Invisible. 
I will not point you out because I know that that will devastate your life right now. <laughs> but there are some of you in this room that they like to be behind the scenes. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't need that other stuff. I don't, I don't need this. I'll, I'll just, I'll be back here in this corner. I just like to celebrate other people's success. You, you. Right? Mr. and Mrs. Invisible. I had some people who, um, a couple came to me with this issue. And this is a leadership question again. They want to stay behind the scenes. And what I told them, the person with the marker makes the money. It's just the way it is. The person with the marker makes the money. You've got to look and act like a leader for people to treat you like one. You are the emotional security blanket for your group. You are the emotional security blanket for your group. Your group is going to look to you and aspire to you, like it or not. This is if you want to have a successful group. For some of you, your group looks and acts like you do. And that may be a good thing, it may not be a good thing. It's up to you. See, I went from being kind of an introverted type of a person to saying, okay, I, I got to get up there. I got to develop a talk. I got to build a little bit of an Im image. And I watched my group. They went, we're on his team. We're on his team. Let's go. Let's prove something because we're on his team. See what I mean? There's a difference between just going through the motions, hoping the system will do it all for you. If the system did it all for you, the company wouldn't need you. The company's asking you to step up and lead a group. Now do it with your own personality, your own brand, but find a way to get up there. They need to be proud of you. The assignment is improve your image. Develop a great, great presentation. Develop a great training. Develop a great three-way call. Develop a great conference call. I learned as an introvert what you can do is psych yourself up. And here's my definition of introverts and extroverts. How many people feel like you're an introvert in the room? Okay. Um, for you introverts, my definition is we lose energy in a group of people. It's not like we don't like other people. We just lose energy. Extroverts gain energy. They get in the room of other people. They they fill up. Extroverts, whoa, their batteries go down like an iPhone. Just whoa. <laughs> and they need time to go recharge where they're not talking to anybody. Um, so for me, I had to develop that muscle because my battery would go out in three minutes. I'd pump it up, my battery would go, choo, gone. And then, it, you know, and then I could hold it for 10 minutes, and then I could hold it for 30 minutes, and then I could hold it for a day if I needed to. You know, and I got it to the point where I could hold it for a weekend. I'm doing a weekend event, I can hold it for a weekend, but then I need some space, some me time. I need to go stare at a wall <laughs> and have a legal pad. Just kind of drool and draw something in the corner. <laughs> you introverts know what I'm talking about. Just that little space, right? All right. Um, Here's the test on this. If asked, what does your group say about you? If asked, what does your group say about you? If, you, if we asked your group, are they proud of you? Are they kind of apologizing for you? Are they bragging about you? Good question. Number nine. Won't deal with problems complex. Won't deal with problems complex. They can't handle confrontation. Cannot handle it. Problem shows up in their group and they avoid, 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 avoid. The lesson here, all distractions are equal. And it's your responsibility as a leader to solve that problem, to take, cut out that negativity. Appeasement never works. Never. When faced with poison, 
The best defense is a fast offense. You get deal with it. The assignment, are there negatives within your group, organization, that haven't been dealt with head on? If, they, if so, then deal with them. Deal with them right now. Fast, quick, and little things turn into big things. Little behaviors left unchecked turn into bigger and more distracting behaviors. Somebody tr treats you poorly or treats the organization poorly or acts inappropriately, you have to act, you have to talk about it. Somebody shows up drunk at the meeting, you have to have a conversation <coughs> right then, that minute. Somebody's supposed to do a two-minute testimonial, they do a ten-minute testimonial. You have to have a discussion that night. It's gotta, you have to change that. Otherwise, left unchecked, it'll be 20 minutes next time. Won't deal with problems. Um, the test is, does your group feel defended by you? Does the group feel defended, or do they feel like you just won't handle the problem because you have the hammer to handle the problem? Number 10, lost lamb syndrome. These are the people who spend all kinds of time with problem children. This is what they do. They just, they're, they're saving lost lambs all day, every day. Fills up their time, gives them a certain sense of esteem. That lamb was lost, and now they're found. <laughs> they're trying to change people, and they're trying to save people. People will change when they're ready to change, and they'll save themselves when they're ready to save them. We can create an environment for that. But if you spend all the time away from the flock and looking for the lost lamb, where's the flock? It's left without direction. Lesson here is, and this is a tough one for those you big-hearted lost lamb folks. You can only afford to spend personal time with those who deserve it. You spend group time with the rest. You tell the lost lambs to be on the call. You tell the lost lambs I'll see you at the meeting. You tell the lost lambs, you know, the convention's going to be amazing. If you spend too much time pulling people out of the ditch, you'll, you'll be in the ditch. So, hard one, really hard one. Because guess what? The lost lambs are loud. <laughs> They're loud. The flock is quiet. Lost lambs are loud. It's hard to tell the lost lambs is just, hey, we're over here. Shish. We're trying to work. <laughs> One to five. Where are you? Oh my gosh. I've got 15, but I'm going to do 11. No. Oh, no. We got, we got a lot of stuff. I'm going to do 12. i got to do 12. Um, <laughs> renegade complex. Renegade complex. These people are so filled up with ego. It's like, whatever, these clowns. These idiots. I'll go show them how to make this thing work. <coughs> I can do this thing. So they unplug. They unplug from the local meetings. They unplug from the training. They unplug from the conventions. They don't even come to conventions. I don't need that convention stuff. All that hype. All that baloney. I'm fine. Our group's fine. You sleep slow. Stay away from our group. The renegade. They don't utilize team meetings or, or events or systems. And the lesson I learned here is the event itself does so much work. And I talk to renegades, many renegades. Yeah, I want to do better, but I don't want to plug into that stuff. I'll lose my sense of self. I said, when did it become about you? 
It's about your team. It's about helping everybody else. What, what's going on? You can't be part of a convention and still have your identity. Bring your identity. You know, make a little flag. Get a little noisemaker that's your, that's your team's flag. Seriously. I, I literally told people, tell everybody to wear the same color for your team if that makes you feel better. And it will make the team feel better. Bring your little flag. We're on the blankety blank team. You're still part of the company. Make a little noise. Everybody sit together. Have a little meeting before the convention and after the convention. Fine, no problem. But there's only so far you can get by yourself and there's tremendous leverage with the big events. They've made me more money in this profession than just about anything else. Number 12. Local burnout syndrome. A leader stays in their hometown too long and business gets stagnant. This is a big one. And there's a million excuses for this one. Well, you don't understand my family dynamic, and you don't understand this, and you don't understand that, and you don't understand whatever. If you're full time, let me give you the assignment or the, the, the lesson that I gave to this person. <clears throat> if you're full time, you need to be spending six days a month outside of your hometown. Doing business building functions outside of your hometown. Your business will explode six days a month. They can be two weekends if you want, two long weekends. Figure it out. You're going to get stuck. You're going to get burnt out. You're going to, it's going to get way too familiar. Your organization is going to start losing respect for you because you're there too much. You're doing too much. Messiah complex creep, creeps in. All of that stuff starts to happen, and you've got to spend six days a month, Dave, out of your hometown building, building teams that you've got. And your, your organization will explode if you do, six days a month. Part-time, I'd still say one or two. You can make it within a drive, a couple days a month. Make it within a drive of your hometown and work with a team. And if you don't have a team within a drive, create a team within a drive. Make it happen. Local burnout can be devastating. You think you're building a power base, and that power base is going to start to resent you. It will. So here's the test. <clears throat> How much of your volume is within 100 miles of you? And how many days are you willing to travel to conduct an event in a long distance market? And one note is at the beginning, you might have to be creative to afford this travel, but you have to do it before the income is going to come. You can't do it after. You've got to be creative, is fine. You know, you can drive, you can caravan, you could, you know, stay in people's houses instead of hotels. You don't have to eat out. You can, you know, pack a cooler in the back of the car. And, Bring your lunch. I've done all of those things. But that will change your business. It will change your life. The mystery three others will have to wait. I want to show, I want to show you a video clip. I want to close with this. I am a big... Um, I've become addicted to learning. Addicted to learning. And one of the great learning sites for me is TED.com. Have you ever watched TED.com? And I was watching two nights ago. This young lady, I was watching a documentary about TED actually, and a young lady by the name of Majora Carter. Majora Carter lives in the Bronx, in New York City. And she has led a cause, a crusade, to try and green up the Bronx. And created a park there and got grants and did all these different things and she did a talk and I watched this talk and one phrase, three words stuck out to me like you can't even believe. I mean it hit me like a ton of bricks. And right before this talk, Al Gore, former Vice President Al Gore was in the audience and I'm not showing that part of the clip, but she says to him, she says, I talked to Mr. Gore after breakfast, and I asked him, you know, what his organization could do 
to help me further my cause. And his, his response was, uh, we have grant programs. And she has the audacity to say, in front of a thousand of the most influential people in the world, no disrespect, but Mr. Gore didn't understand. I was making him an offer. Wow. So at the end of her talk, she gives this one minute. Uh, would that, you know. I have come from so far to meet you like this. Please don't waste me. By working together, we can become one of those small, rapidly growing groups of, of individuals who actually have the audacity and courage to believe that we actually can change the world. We might have come to this conference from very, very different stages in life, but believe me, we all share one incredibly powerful thing. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Ciao, bellos. Did you catch the three words? Wow. Don't waste me to a thousand of the most influential, powerful people in the world, she says. Don't waste me. So what I will tell you on this weekend, your life is coming to you just like she came to those people. You know what it's saying? Don't waste me. Your time, your life, your effort, your energy is precious and it's limited. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. I would say the network marketing profession is coming to you also. And you know what it's saying? Don't waste me. I can give you the tool to unlock freedom and lifestyle and, and benefit to millions of people around the world. I've come to you from so far, don't waste me. And lastly, I would say, send out cards is coming to you. And you know what they're saying? Don't waste me. We have an opportunity. We have an amazing group of people. We have a product that changes lives. Don't waste it, it's precious. We'll never be able to have this time again. Don't waste me. I love you all, thank you very much.